America. My name is Amir Ose Frimpong, and I come to you every week. Usually about four, it's a little bit later today. And I, today is a special episode because uh, it looks like a lot of people in these United States are going to be homeschooling. And that means they are going to be teaching their kids. And there's uh, in many districts, they're going to be online aspects. But I am going to ignore the online aspects because I don't think that putting your kids in front of a television or putting your kids in front of a, uh, an online program is the same as actually teaching your kids and what they would get at public school. So I'm just going to eschew the online option and just homeschool my kids for the next year so they don't get the COVID unless the school comes with a decentralized option. But I think I'm not the only one, and I think I can help a lot of people. So if you just kind of do what I do with my kids, I think your kids are going to be fine. So I'm going to walk you through my homeschooling uh, apparatus, and I'm going to do it after I hit the beat. To the beat, y'all. Uh, yeah. Good to me. Never change the ways for the world or the government. If it was the president, then I would state facts. You leave it up to me, I paint the White House black and it can feature in your front. So, yes, the school districts who are going 100% online are, I think, doing it the wrong way. I honestly think that'll, that'll lead to about 50% of the kids who come from a disadvantaged background just being put in front of the TV all year. I'm not happy about that decision, but if you actually do want to homeschool your kid pretty well, I think I have I think I have at least a system for my household figured out, and I think I could save you a little bit of time if you just do what I do. I think your kid will be fine. I have two kids uh, that of school age. I have a three-year-old also, a seven-year-old and a five-year-old, both girls, and I'm I, I'm lucky enough to have a pretty loose schedule in some ways, so I can take care of their schooling in the morning and then kind of drop them off at a hermetically sealed daycare and then come back and pick them up. But the first book I suggest you buy if you're going to do this is uh, The Well-Trained Mind. It's actually a nice, it's a well put together book just about how to get your mind around the, the, the process and a guide to classical education at home, The Well-Trained Mind. They do pretty good work. And this is just a general guide about how to think through the process once again. The Well-Trained Mind mind and this is going to be this little episode is going to be black focused because i'm black raising black girls so uh that that's just how it's going to be but also uh, at that age like i said seven and five the big deal is for me is just kind of reading and writing and I, so my kids also take suzuki um uh piano and uh, suzuki violin and cello i'm a pretty good musician so I take care of most of those lessons, and we do the Suzuki lessons where they play violin and cello online with their Suzuki teacher. But I work with them every morning on playing at home. I think it's important just because it gets you thinking about something that's very subtle. And if you have excellence in music, it kind of trains you to uh, understand excellence in other aspects. So, uh, and the, actually the online, to, the online teaching since I actually am a musician myself, the online teaching is, is works because I can fill in the gaps. So the online lessons, and I have a pretty good system set up for audiovisual communication here at home just because I do this for you. So the music is where I actually spend a lot of time just because I, I, people underestimate the sensitivities and the sensibilities that, that serious, mu serious music studies like... Um, confers so that's what i do also um in terms of reading so i read with my kids in terms of reading i do read with my kids there's a fantastic book called uh tales for little rebels i'm going to give the tales tales for little rebels All right, so the thing about this book is it's, I, I, I like reading out of it. I also like It's Raining Cats and Noodles out of, from Jack Polanski, or Paluzzi, Paluzzi. But Tales for Little Rebels is, is really good. All right, so uh, there are a few stories in here you have to watch. One, you have to know that the format of the book is horrible. It's atrocious. It's actually hard to find the stories. 
It's a crime. However, the stories themselves, some of them are actually very, very good. Mr. His, um, the princess who stood on her own two feet, Oscar the Ostrich, and the Practical Princess, and Mary who stays at a school. I'll say it again. Mr. His, the princess who stood on her own two feet, the Practical Princess, Oscar the Ostrich, Mary who stays after school. You have to understand with me, it's just any school, any princess story that doesn't end with uh, taking down the the constitutional, uh, the, the monarchy and installing a constitutional democracy is a little bit suspicious. But they, these stories do it really well because they actually tell students about how to think through their work relationships in the future. And this is important to do now because, um, you know, there's stories like the Little Red Hen and there are all these other like fairy tales that actually send the wrong kind of message. So the stories here, those, those stories especially, will keep your kid from kind of thinking about exploitation in the right way. I think. All right, so now my 70-year-old, it's kind of a working sensibility of how to organize a union, um, some, like, how to identify various gender and felicities, how to um, think about what to be in the world and to be just and think about it. You know, I, I, there are little things I tell my kids that apparently other kids don't hear. For example, I always tell my kids, the sign of maturity is how you handle frustration. That is maturity. If you don't know, the opposite of freedom is frustration. How you handle fr uh, frustration is pretty much how mature you are. So at, in every aspect of your parenting, you should be teaching your kid how to handle frustration in a responsible, productive manner. I know people are like, don't tell people how to be parents. I tell people how to be parents all the time. I'm a good parent. It's not exactly the case that this is obvious or natural. So I've studied. I tell people how to be a parent. What you should be doing as a parent is getting your kid used to handling frustration in a productive way. In a productive way. And enabling people to handle frustration in a productive way. Because that's going to be the difference between a mature and immature person. So... Um, that's the book I read to my kids, Tales for Little Rebels, there are other books. There are, um, my kids also like to draw. However, the drawing book, the five and seven year old drawing book I got for the How to Draw People, like, the, 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 what's out there is pretty much how to draw white people. That wasn't acceptable. So what I did was I commissioned my friend to put together kind of a book worth of, uh, you know, how to draw diagrams for black people. And uh, I'll release it probably in a few weeks once I get time. But like it's, like, and yeah, so now my children draw black people, which I think is better. So um, I commissioned these drawings. Uh, I'll, I'll slap them together in a book and uh, I'll tell you when I release it. You can just buy it probably from this site. But I was just upset that all of the how to draw books were pretty much for white kids, and that's my kids aren't white, and that wasn't going to work. So, in addition to that, we have reading, right? So there was this um, series called Modern Curriculum Press, the Spelling Workout. Spelling Workout by Modern, Modern, uh, Modern Curriculum Press. This is the best series I can find, and you just work the system. It starts with A. It goes all the way through D. You just work, just get A, and just work the system. What I like about this is I could actually, since my 7 year olds a little bit ahead of my 5-year-old, I can actually put them together and have my 7-year-old help my 5-year-old work through the book. Right. And the stakes are a little bit lower for my five-year-old. I mean, she can read a little bit. I mean, they're all, it's me. So, yeah, they're a little bit ahead of um, grade level. But what I like about these books is that it's simple. And it starts out simple and just gets more complicated as the students get more comfortable both reading and writing. And, and it's just a good series if you have kids who are struggling with reading. 
And the stories at the beginning start out very simple because they have very simple words. But then as you get more com- uh, they get more complicated, they just get more complicated and they get other knowledge um, through reading the stories at the beginning of each lesson. So that's, if you care about their reading and writing, the Modern Curriculum Press. This is book B, but uh, I have book A through D. They've already worked through A. They're, all, they're both on B right now. And um, also teaches them how to read cursive, which I think is important. Good series of books. This will take. This will solve that problem. And you just work the system. Start with A. Don't skip around. I'm not a skip around type of guy, just in general in life. But don't skip around. Just start with A and just have the kids just work it. It works if you work it, so work it because you're worth it. And you keep coming back. All right, math. Uh, it turns out the Singaporeans really know what's going on and how to teach math. So there is uh, the math books that are based on how Singapore, how the Ministry of Education in Singapore, but made for, but kind of a, there's a U.S. edition of those same books. They are fantastic put together. Once again, you just work the system. My kids are on 2A right now. They're five and seven. My five-year-old can now like subtract using remainders three digits out. Like uh, uh, renaming, uh, I mean, subtract borrow, by borrowing with like digits in the hundreds. Just because the way they explain math is so systematic. And I'm a systematic philosopher, so I appreciate that in a lot of ways. Um, so you just work. Work the system. And once again, this starts with just work 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B. And I, I can't, I have complete faith that just working with them through these books is going to handle the math education. And so when you buy it, you just uh, look for primary mathematics, a workbook, and textbook. And it's, it's simply great. It's simply great. It does the work. So my kids can do math. Also, in terms of uh, gamifying it, I'm a, I'm a fan of gamifying things when I can. Plus, I've read that's a good way to do things. What I did was I had a, I have a Monopoly board and a chess timer and some D&D dice. You know, D&D dice have like 10-sided dice and 12-sided dice. So what I do is each uh, with one of my kids is I set the chess timer and we just try to race around the Monopoly board. I like it because Monopoly boards are base 10. And so you get used to counting, and you get used to doing the adding quickly. And so you set the chess timer. They roll the dice. Um, count one, two, three, four, five. They roll the dice, move their players, and then hit their side of the chess timer. And then I roll the dice, move my token, and hit my side of the chess timer. And I, we race around. And you can do that with uh, – and since these are D&D dice, uh, you can do that with adding and subtracting. And it gets them kind of quick with – uh, adding and subtracting, and you can gamify it. And thinking about pitting, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> I'm thinking about pitting the two of them together um, because that's uh, I don't know. That's good. All right. So, uh, but usually I just play with them, and the chess timer actually makes all the difference. They gamify it, and all they have to do they get into it themselves. So I'm. This was kind of a genius idea by me to institute this. I use a Monopoly board and a little bit of this for a few days, and then quick math became quick. And you could use subtraction also, which is good. You just say, all right, big number minus a little number, and you have like a 20-sided dice and a, and a, and a, a 10-sided die and a 6-sided die, and they roll it, and then they do the, learn how to do quick subtraction. So that's uh, – and then yeah, test timer. 15 bucks. Solve my kid's math problem. I know, you're welcome, right? So, uh, be wary of the online schooling because that's functionally just putting your kids, I think 50% of districts that go online, their poor kids are going to just be put in front of a TV. Because you, like, you, can't, you can't learn online if you're 8, 9, 10. That's just not serious, unless you, have a, unless you have an adult who's walking you through it. But, you know, these adults work. My mom worked. I watched a lot of television growing up. A lot of television. I'll say this again. I watched a lot of television growing up. Was it the best for me? I don't know. But, like, my mom worked. So television, I had an older sister, and television was pretty much our babysitter. Uh, so I'm going to do a little bit better by my kids through that. But I'm also in a situation where I can teach them in the morning and then deposit them at kind of a uh, very 
who all put together daycare in the afternoon. Um, so I think like, my kids are going to do fine through the pandemic, but the problem is public education isn't with my kids. It's about the kids my kids have to deal with, and I think we're going to lose a lot. So if you have any sway in your local district, you need to push them to decentralize. Like classroom rooms are too big, so they're going to go to classrooms and you don't want them to get COVID. So there are too many bodies in the room and too many bodies in the school. So you just need to decentralize public schools and have, you know, just many different rooms and many different buildings. Uh, abandoned storefronts, rec rooms, uh, church rec rooms and convention centers, whatever. And you just need to have many different, like, you just need to disperse public education. And so more than 10, 15 people aren't in a uh, room. So that's how you deal with that. And, you know, we underestimate how many people are just going to become racist by being taught by their kids. Because remember, th this woman's also going to be is homeschooling her grandkids, and that's going to be a problem. Athens is not Minneapolis. Athens is not Baltimore. Athens is not Atlanta. We do not have systemic racism here. Athens is not Minneapolis. So we're going to have to homeschool in a way that actually trains our kids to deal with whatever products that grandma ends up dealing with and uh, or producing through her homeschooling. So like I feel some sort of way about that. I wish schools would just get on the decentralizing tip and that would solve that. But once again, quick math, get a chess timer, use a Monopoly board. They can just take tokens and just race around the board. You can set up games. Uh, I mean, Monopoly is a pretty good game to count uh, to, to do counting anyway, but it's long and sometimes I don't want to commit to actually playing the game. But the chess timer just to get the quick math done solves that problem. The Singapore math book series. Perfect. Perfect. Um, yeah, just put in uh, uh, Marshall Cavendish is the U.S. publishing company that makes it, but it's based on the Ministry of Education in Singapore. And you just work the system. The system works if you work it, so work it because you're worth it. And you keep coming back. Modern Curriculum Press. These series of books are pretty fantastic. And uh, just to get your mind around the project, The Well-Trained Mind. And I actually feel good. They also came out with a grammar book. The first one's really good. I haven't had time to... I, I worked with my daughter on it last summer. I mean, just, you know, nouns, verbs, some poems to memorize. It's it's good. Uh, I, I, and they have resources in here, and here is how I learned about the other ones. But, you, like, they give you a lot of resources, so I just want to give you the good ones so that you know. And I think if you do that, at least your family will do fine uh, throughout the pandemic homeschooling. And, and like I said, the system works. The system works if you work it. And in terms of radical literature, oh, also John, hi John the Conqueror, in the in the in the in the, in the Rebels book, it's pretty fantastic. Although it's a pretty um, adult story, so your kids have to be in junior high. But hi John the Conqueror in the in the it's a it's a story put together in this book. It's a story put together from the Black Panthers because the Black Panthers, you know, they thought through things, so they had a children's book series. And Hi John the Conqueror was one of the stories that one of the black, a guy named Lester, Julius Lester, I believe his name was, wrote. So this book, uh, if you can track it down, I think it's, it's really fantastic. And I don't know. I think, it's, I think it's good. I think it's good. It's also put, the format is atrocious. So you have to actually, once you learn how to find the stories, it's good. But the stories are all, they start with an introduction that's very boring and, and like, just you don't need so you skip the introduction look for the footnotes and then after the footnotes the actual story begins that's when you start reading with your kid and you want to read uh mr his the practical princess the princess who stood on her own two feet uh oscar the ostrich and my favorite i didn't cry but like i, I might have like thought about it maria who stays after school which is uh, like a lovely 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 story and with that i am gonna go peace 
if you appreciate the work I do every week and you think that I should continue to do it because I'm giving you the quality of political knowledge and insight that will help you not squander your life and kind of rescue meaning from it, then go ahead and go to www.funkyacademic.com and kick in five, fifteen, or fifty dollars a month, or make one enormous donation. I like the monthlies because it allows me to budget more, and that'll help me, you know, with a marketing budget or getting better equipment that works all the time. Because a lot of, in a lot of ways, freedom means having equipment that works every time you turn it on. <laughs> and I want to be a free Negro, so. Um, if you like what I do, go to funkyacademic.com and contribute. Thanks often comes in the form of cash. And the site takes 